traffic in London in the 1840s was unspeakable. Over 10,000 horse-drawn buses, herds of cattle, handcarts, and flocks of geese. What London needed was a decent transport system. Congestion didn't start with the car. The centre of London has always been a crowded place, and when you start putting a large number of horse-drawn vehicles into the equation, it very soon clogged up. The traditional way for people with money to get around was to use the river as its main artery. But if you didn't have any money, you used these. Your legs. You walked. London, in the early 19th century, was grinding to a halt. A new way of transporting people had to be found if the capital wanted to keep moving. In 1838, 13 years after the Stockton and Darlington Railway, the South finally caught up with North, and London got its first railway. The steam lines up North had originally been built for the transportation of freight, coal, cotton and cattle. But London's new steam line was purpose-built for passengers, or commuters, as they soon came to be known. And it's a staggering piece of engineering. There are 878 brick arches, an amazing number of bricks, straight as a die. London Bridge to Greenwich, four miles. Extraordinary. It wasn't just the first train line into London, it was the first urban train line anywhere in the world. And because it's urban, the statistics become staggering. You're not just laying track over green fields, you have to build it. So, we've got 878 arches in total, and you've got 400 men laying 10,000 bricks per day, which is a total of 60 million bricks. The first railway tracks had been laid into the pulsating heart of the capital. But the building of train lines and stations took up a huge amount of space, something which the crowded financial centre could not accommodate. The City of London was determined not to have any mainline stations within its boundaries, so all the termini were built on what were then the outskirts. In 1837, Euston was finished, and in 1838, the sleepy little village of Paddington got this. Well, not quite all of this. Paddington Station started off fairly small until Brunel demolished the early one to build its huge gateway to the west in 1854. To the south of the city, it wasn't just inadequate stations that were being levelled for the new steam sensation. To build these new huge grand termini, Large areas of slum housing were cleared, but the people who lived there didn't have much of a say in the matter, because in the 1830s, the poor didn't have a vote, so obviously they didn't matter. The early trains were a vast improvement. They got you out of the city quicker, but ironically, they made conditions inside the city more chaotic and cramped. Thousands of families were forcibly displaced by the building of the lines and termini, moving into nearby already overcrowded areas, making the streets of London even more congested than before. What Londoners needed was a transport system that made the city less crowded. There was just one place to go. London was going to have to go underground. Charles Pearson, a solicitor for the City of London, was the first person to come up with the idea of an underground railway, and he had grand ideas. A road 100 feet wide with eight tracks beneath it. Yeah, right. Charles Pearson was such an advocate of the underground railway that he poured his own money into his proposal for the scheme. Of course, when he first suggested it, he was ridiculed. And Dr Cumming was heard to quit. Why not build an overhead railway? 
It's better to wait for the devil than to build roads into hell. But Pearson was something of a visionary, who had drawn up his plans for an underground railway because of his concerns about the dreadful overcrowding in the city. Despite his efforts to get the project going, he never received any payment for his hard work. But Pearson knew that tunnels could be made to work, that railways could be built underground. His ideas were inspired by a piece of tunnelling genius. In 1843, the year Pearson first proposed his idea, a French engineering entrepreneur by the name of Marc Brunel had completed a tunnel under the Thames, helped by his son by the name of Isambard. It was never built with trains in mind, but it pioneered a vital engineering technique that made the tube possible, plus its popularity. Over four million people descended into its murky subterranean depths in the first year, convinced Pearson that people would travel underground. Pearson was almost certainly one of the many visitors to Brunel's tunnel under the Thames. He was inspired by its popularity and also with the very ingenious way that it had been constructed. For Marc Brunel had created what is known as the tunneling shield. This is how it works. If this is my tunneling face, I am working at my station. I'm protected all around by a wooden structure. And behind me is the tunnel. Now, to keep this shield in place, to keep it pressed against this surface, as we build the tunnel behind, we use jacks. And those jacks keep the shield pressed up against the face. Plus, every single piece I'm working at has a board in front of it. And that board itself is jacked to the shield. So in order to work forwards, I take the jacks off boards individually, take them out, work away at my small portion like that, remove all the soil, and then I can move the board further on. So it inches forward and behind the bricks are lined and the whole thing moves forward. Brilliant. This was Brunel's iron tunnelling shield. Brunel's tunnel was designed to be an underground road, a subterranean urban experience with stalls between the arches. But it was so costly to build that the road approaches were never built. It was an economic disaster. There were at least five major floods and 20 people were killed, but it was a technological breakthrough. And here it is. Brunel's tunnel, taken over and still used by London Underground, stretches for over 365 metres under the Thames. It had taken 18 years to build and had gone three times over its original budget. It may not have been an economic success, but it inspired the likes of Charles Pearson to imagine that London could become a truly three-dimensional city. And 20 years after he first suggested the idea, Work on an underground railway began. Brunel's tunnel under the Thames had inspired Charles Pearson to push forward the idea of an underground railway. But it had taken 18 years to build and had been extremely expensive. There was no way Pearson could ever build his underground using Brunel's method. He teamed up with the leading engineer, John Fowler, who in 1860 solved the problem with a brilliant but radical solution. John Fowler, the engineer in charge, chose a method of construction called cut and cover, and it had a disastrous impact on the streets of London. The cut and cover method was brutally simple. You cleared everything along the line of your intended track, then you cut, and then you covered it over again. The fortnightly review reported the destruction of over 900 houses for just two miles of track. Some of them were rebuilt, and some of them weren't. In fact, this rather lovely West London street hides a terrible, dark secret. Because number 23 and number 25 Leinster Gardens 
are a complete sham. They're merely facades. There's a railway here. How beastly. When they were building the line, sewers had to be moved. They frequently found human remains that were sent off to be reburied outside the city, and the river fleet burst in, bringing down the retaining walls and flooding all the tunnels up to three metres deep. But despite the setbacks, it was only three years before the underground tunnels were ready for the arrival of the steam trains. Charles Pearson, the visionary solicitor, Never got to see the Metropolitan Line carry passengers from Farringdon to Paddington. Sadly, he died just four months before the grand opening. On the 10th of January, 1863, the Metropolitan Railway Company finally opened for business and passengers could be conveyed along dark tunnels between the underground stations of King's Cross, Gower Street, Portland Road and Baker Street. Over 30,000 people travelled on the Metropolitan Line underground to Paddington. The press had doubted that many would brave the journey, but thousands more flocked into the stations until the harassed platform staff were forced to cry, No room! No room! Passengers made the three-mile journey behind one of these. And this is the last surviving example. It's here at the London Transport Museum in Covent Garden. A steam locomotive underground. How on earth did they do that? Well, Daniel Gooch from the Great Western Railway came up with the first ones, but the following year, 1864, after the railway was opened, these arrived, made by Bayer Peacock in Manchester. What they did was the steam was exhausted from the cylinder via a pipe all the way along here into the water tank, into the side tank. And there it condensed in the cold water. Of course, the water didn't stay cold for very long. So periodically, the trains had to go into a vent, blowing huge clouds of steam vertically. Towards the end of the century, everything changed. Londoners got electricity. Turbine halls were built to keep up with the demand for the new power source. Electricity was the new, adaptable, clean power source. Electrically powered trains would mean there would be no more smoke in the tunnels. The ride would be clean and comfortable. So, instead of carrying the fuel on board and churning out smoke and steam into the tunnels, huge generators produced the power and the trains could run through much cleaner tunnels on electrified rails. By using electric trains, tunnels no longer needed vents. And with better tunnelling techniques, railways could avoid church graveyards, sewers and crypts by going much, much deeper. The new tunnels were dug using a variant of the system developed by Mark Brunel. But this was improved on by a chap called James Greathead. What Greathead did, he used the Greathead shield, as it later became, and he used compressed air behind the shield to force leakages out, to, to, to create a barrier. He also used cast iron sections bolted together. This was better than the brick and mortar used by Brunel, much quicker, so much so, that whereas the Brunel shield at its worst point had progressed only one foot in a month, the Great Head shield could progress 70 feet in a week. And the first three and a half mile tunnel was dug in four years. Using the Great Head Shield, the first underground electric railway was finished in December 1890. It was the very acme of progress. Hydraulic lifts, 
took passengers down to platforms to ride on the new electric trains. It ran from the city, King William Street, to Stockwell in the south. The London pioneers had created the first electric tube system in the world. Passengers avoided the dirt and smoke of the steam lines, but it was an uncomfortable railway, a very hard ride and prone to power cuts because there wasn't any national grid in 1890 and the city and south London railway had to generate its own electricity with enormous steam engines and they often failed. It got some things very right and some things very wrong. Every station had a guard who was employed to shout out the name of the station when the train arrived because the first carriages or padded cells as they were nicknamed didn't have any windows. They didn't think they'd need them underground in the dark. By 1905, all the steam lines had been converted to electricity and the tube system was expanding fast. Despite the increase in people working in London, the people who actually had to live in the dirty centre of the city fell spectacularly once railways existed to move them out and back. They fell by 80% between 1851 and the turn of the century. And because of railways, the city expanded widthways, over three times as wide in 40 years. The railway companies made a profit from the land they built and generated income for their stations and services by building new communities outside London. They created suburbia. In fact, one of the first ones was Surbiton. And the story doesn't end there. As modern London continues to extend, so do the modern train lines. Hang on a minute. No driver. Because it's been driven by Fred. Or rather, Fred, as the traffic controller, is monitoring the computer that's driving the train. The challenge to provide efficient mass transport systems is still with us. And like the early railway builders, nowadays we use technology to solve the problems. This virtual reality paradise is the control centre of a modern rapid <coughs> transport system, the Docklands Light Railway. It deals with power supply, traffic control, security and rolling stock. Railway lines have always been vital to the expanding city in the 19th century and now in the 21st century. Here, in London's Docklands, the Docklands Light Railway is pushing east from Canning Town towards the London City Airport. Now, the problem with urban railways, now as in the 19th century, is there's a lot of stuff already there, sewers, water, not to mention other people's houses. And the solution here is to build a railway on piers so it doesn't disturb the infrastructure beneath too much and it allows the traffic and pedestrians to pass underneath. So how exactly do they do it? First of all you prepare your ground and then you drive your piles. There are ten of them here. You can see the reinforcing bars that stick up from each pile. They have to go down up to 30 metres to cut through all this London clay and reach the layers of sand underneath to give proper foundation. Then, to spread the load on those piles, you put a cap on top. That's that box there. And sticking up out of that are the reinforcing bars that will take the piers that will carry the sections that carry the railway. So this is the concrete pad that will take the weight of the pier. Those supporting rods went into this. These aren't brought to sight, these piers, they're cast here. Inside, this steel shuttering, poured in one go. And on top of that, we'll sit the deck, the superstructure that carries the rails. Impressive. And this is the superstructure, the decking that sits on top of the piers. You can see where the pier portion goes down there. And like the piers, these are also cast on site but in these huge moulds. The clever thing about these moulds, in order to ensure 
that there's a superb fit between each section of the superstructure is that the piece of superstructure that's already been cast acts as one end of the mould. So there is no way they won't fit together perfectly. Furthermore, you can see these holes here. Steel cables are passed through those, and when it's all fitted together, it's tightened and tensioned, so the whole thing is rigid. Each precast interlocking section of deck is then lifted into position and bolted together, supported by this huge gantry. The gantry is not yet in operation, but it's an incredibly ingenious piece of machinery. And this is basically how it works. It supports itself on the piers. It never comes down to earth. It lays each section bolted together and then moves itself along to the next pier and repeats the process. So it just keeps going. <coughs> supporting itself in the air. Railways are still the most efficient and cleanest form of urban transportation. It's 166 years since the London to Greenwich Railway built brick arches to carry steam railways. These are the brick arches of today and they'll be carrying driverless electric trains, but they're still doing the same job, carrying masses of people quickly and easily around the city. It is easy to forget the impact of technology over the past 200 years, and we now take the railways for granted. The system built by the founding fathers of the railways made us into the world leaders in railway technology, a lead we have now let slip away. <sighs> Waiting for the train. Seems to be a very British experience, doesn't it? And we moan about it constantly. But somehow we're not prepared to take the decision to do something about it. One thing that I've learned during this series about railways and the way they were built is that you needed two things, energy and investment, and until we decide to provide both of those, we're going to be waiting for the train. I thought that was good. Yeah, that's fine. No worries. As a programme ending. Yeah, yeah. Right anybody's way. listening. <laughs> what are you doing? You filming something? 